Hello everyone, our topic for today is patriarchy and gender inequality. Now when we speak about patriarchy and gender inequality, let us remind ourselves of what the word patriarchy over here means. The term patriarchy refers to male domination. Now, male domination within societies, does this male domination within society affect the extent to which women experience, women have their experiences within religions? Now to be able to discuss this, we talk about religions putting them into two main categories. Initially, we'd speak about the more traditional forms of religion, which are over here referred to as conservative religions. This is what we're talking about. And on the other hand, we'd speak about the newer forms of religions, that is NRMs. So we talk about a comparison over here between the traditional forms of religion and the new religious movements and the extent to which females experience uh, inequality within them. So when we speak about patriarchy and women in conservative religions, now before we proceed, let us remind let us remind ourselves of what uh, the author over here refers to when they write about conservative religions. Now, when we speak about conservative religions, we are talking about religions such as Christianity, religions such as Hinduism. Religions such as Jews, or to put it in a better manner, Orthodox Jews, etc. Now, the extent to which these religions are conservative or are seen as being conservative by many. Now, conservative religions, which tend to support traditional values. Now, we're referring to them as conservative religions, probably because they support traditional values. They're often seen as the most oppressive types of religion for women. Now, over you'll be talking about different examples. For instance, we may refer to fundamentalism or we may refer to evangelicalism. Now, when we speak about fundamentalism, we use the word fundamentalism to refer to the forms of religion that show strict sort of adherence towards the fundamentals of that particular religion, leaving no room for any sort of flexibility. Now, fundamentalism and evangelicalism, which advocate traditional morality, they advocate traditional morality, they advocate the importance of females playing domestic roles and the modesty of women. So there are three things that I'd want us to keep in mind. Number one, the strict emphasis on traditional morality. Number two, the extent to which these religions, they advocate women being restricted to domestic roles. And number three, modesty for women. They seem to be particularly patriarchal. For instance, if you talk about examples over here in Catholicism, now, when we use the word Catholicism, we are referring to the Roman Catholic Church, right? In Catholicism, there are strict rules governing men and women's sexuality. For example, prohibiting sex outside marriage or abortion. Now, this again is an example of traditional morality. Here you go, right? Now, furthermore, there are strict rules concerning women's sexuality, even within approved relationships, such as marriage amongst Orthodox Jews. Now, we are using examples over here. Number one, we use the example of Catholicism. Number two, we use the example of Orthodox Jews. These examples also suggest that religion might affect women in different ways, and women might end up having different experiences as compared to men. And therefore, generalizations about religion or the experiences individuals within religion have might not be uh, might 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 not be generalizable, right? Or the extent to which the the extent to which people claim that women and men they're treated equally within religion is being questioned over here, right? Now, remember we are discussing all of this under the heading of feminism, and uh, all of what we're discussing, most of what we're discussing is uh, the feminist view, right? However, some feminist sociologists question whether they necessarily always succeed in oppressing women. Now, we spoke about two different school of thoughts over here. On one extreme, we spoke about a group that believes that these traditional, typical world religions, they end up oppressing females or the experiences that males and females have is different. And on the other hand, we spoke about how there are people who 
how there are researches that have been conducted, how there are different authors, different sociologists, different, uh, uh, different, different, different uh, social commentators who have questioned this claim. So however, some feminist sociologists question whether they necessarily always succeed in oppressing women. A number of researchers have found evidence that women find space within such religions to develop their own ideas or use aspects of religions to further their own interests. Now, in this case, we would be discussing this study that was conducted by Sophie Gillian Ray in 2010. And according to Ray in 2010, uh, 2010 it is not necessary. It is not necessary to uh, assume that females are always oppressed through religion. Ray gives an example of British-born Muslim girls. And through this example, she's trying to put some light on the idea that in many instances, there are young girls who are actually benefiting out of religion. Now, how is it that they're benefiting out of religion over here? Now, Ray points out that some British-born girls and, and young women wear hijab. Now, what is a hijab? I'd like to assume we all know what a hijab is. They wear a hijab, a scarf that covers their head and hair, as a means to negotiating approval from their parents to go into higher education or paid employment. We are talking about young girls. The example that Ray gives over here is of British-born Muslim girls, how these young girls actually use religion to get the liberty or to get the opportunity, to avail the opportunity to uh to 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 uh to get further education or to be uh, paid uh, to be uh, employed or to work somewhere because of religion. Now, what, what Ray is trying to explain over here as is that these young girls, these young girls, they put religion to use. How is it that they're putting your religion to use by wearing a hijab? There are more of chances that they would get an approval from the parents, from the wider family to be a part of the society as others do, such as getting into higher education, such as getting a job somewhere, working somewhere. This may help to explain why many conservative religions are embraced by significant members, significant number of women. Now about Ray, a uh, quick little idea about who Ray is, Professor Sophie Gilliatt Ray from the Cardiff University. And Professor Ray, remember, conducted a study in 2010. And according to Ray, young British Muslim girls, they actually make use of religion to be able to get permission from their parents to, uh, to, 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 to get into higher education or to get jobs. One. Number two, let's talk about the relationship between Islam and Wheeling. Wheeling, also referred to as Parda, is uh, seen as an oppressive measure by many people from the West. However, there are other Muslim sociologists, there are other, uh, there are other, other, other sociologists from the uh, Middle East, though they have actually approved of uh, wheeling and they do not really see wheeling as being oppressive. Now, many feminists view the issue of wheeling and modest dress among Islamic women as controversial. Rachel Ronaldo, who's Rachel Ronaldo over here? Rachel Ronaldo from the University of Colorado. This theorist is a cultural sociologist interested in gender globalization, social change, religion, and qualitative methods with a special focus on the developing world and the Muslim societies in Southeast Asia. Now, taking this ahead, Rachel Ronaldo notes that as Wheeling, Rachel Ronaldo notes that as Wheeling regained popularity in the 1970s and 1980s. Now, according to Ronaldo in 2010, when Wheeling started gaining popularity, when Wheeling started gaining popularity in the 1970s and 1980s, there was a reaction from feminists that was overwhelmingly negative about Wheeling. So, according to Ronaldo, Wheeling gained popularity in the 1970s and 1980s. And when Wheeling gained popularity, many uh, uh, feminists, many feminists took this as uh, a negative thing. They reacted in a very negative manner to this. They saw this practice of re Wheeling as a reassertion of patriarchy. Now, according to Ronaldo, 
this act of wheeling was seen by many feminist sociologists, by many feminists actually, as a reassertion of patriarchy, as patriarchy being reasserted. I'd like to remind you all of what patriarchy is. Patriarchy is male domination, and they felt like the act of wheeling, when it was gaining popularity, especially in the 1970s and 1980s, many feminists, they saw this as a reassertion or patriarchy being reasserted. After the Islamic Revolution in Iran in 1979, for example, wheeling was made compulsory and some saw this as a direct attack on women's right. However, these assumptions have been challenged by a number of other feminist writers. So according to uh, Rachel Rinaldo, there are three things that I'd want you all to keep in mind. According to Rinaldo, number one, when wheeling gained popularity in the 1970s and 1980s many feminists they saw it as a reassertion of patriarchy one she further exemplifies this through the uh, through 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 the islamic revolution and uh, the iranian revolution the iranian revolution from 1979 after which wheeling was made compulsory for young females and she, uh, she, she, she further adds on that this was seen as a direct attack on women's right. However, another thing, this assumption that wheeling is a direct attack on women's right has been challenged, has been challenged by many feminist writers as well. Now, taking this ahead, and let's speak about Helen Watson. Now, before I move on to Helen Watson, let me remind you all, we are discussing all of this under the heading of how conservative religions affect or how is it that women have their experiences within these conservative religions or the uh, these, these, these more popular traditional forms of religion. If we speak about the different theories that we've discussed over here, number one, my dear, we spoke about Professor Sophie Gilliatt, Ray, and number two, we spoke, spoke about Rachel Rinaldo. Number three, we discussed Helen Watson. So the third reference we have over here is of Helen Watson. Having a look at what Helen Watson has to say, but before that, let's have a look at who she is. Now, Professor Helen Watson from the University of Cambridge, from the Department of Social Anthropology. Professor Helen Watson, this is a bit of detail about her. You might as well visit the website of the University of Cambridge so that you're able to know more. So the th third theorist we have over here is Professor Helen Watson. Let's have a look at what Watson has to say about wheeling and the relationship between wheeling and Islam. Watson argues that wheeling of Islamic women can be interpreted as beneficial to them. Now, this is a different side of the spectrum. We are talking about how according to Watson, the entire idea of wheeling is not seen negatively by all females, is not seen negatively or a reassertion towards patriarchy, how it is not seen as a direct attack on women's rights. How, and uh, On the other hand, she believes that wheeling for many Islamic women plays a very beneficial role. She examined three Muslim women. Now, um, uh, about Watson, Watson's research has uh, been methodologically questioned by many people based on the idea that you cannot simply conduct a research on three females and assume that their views would reflect the views of all Muslim women. One. Number two, she chose to conduct research on females who, uh, who, who, who uh, voluntarily chose to uh, wheel unlike women who are, as they say, uh, forced into it. So her methodology has been questioned. Nonetheless, uh, uh, her research plays a very important role in terms of providing a counter argument to many feminists. Now, according to Watson in 1994, she argues that wheeling of Islamic women can be interpreted as beneficial to them. She examined three Muslim women and the responses to wheeling and finds that Islamic women in a globalized world can use wheels in a positive way. Now, wheeling being seen in a positive manner over here. Wheeling being seen as in a positive manner over here. A Western, as Western cultures try to influence Islamic countries and more Muslims live in the Western world, the wheel can take on new meanings for women. Now, Watson, Professor Watson is trying to 
uh, built in a correlation between how the development of modernization, between how this cultural imperialism or Western imperial imperialism has affected females. And as a response, females from the Muslim origin, they have started seeing wheeling as a positive thing. They have started seeing uh, wheeling as a mean through which they could actually fit into this uh, more globalized world. Now, as Western culture tries to influence Islamic countries, as Western culture tries to influence Islamic countries, and more Muslim more Muslims live in the Western world, the wheel can take on new meanings for women. For example, for Nadia, a second generation British Asian woman studying medicine at university actively chose to start wheeling, uh, start wearing a wheel when she was 16. Now, Remember when I said Watson had conducted her research on uh, three young females and amongst them, one of them was Nadia and Nadia was a second generation British Asian woman. She was studying medicine and she chose to wear a wheel at the age of 16. And according to Nadia, wearing a wheel actually made her stand out. According to Nadia, she was proud of her religion she was proud of her identity as a muslim right she was proud of her religion and wanted others to know that she was muslim she felt that it is liberating to have the freedom of movement and to be able to communicate with people without being on show this is very beautifully mentioned here it is liberating to have the freedom of movement and to be able to communicate with people without being on show right according to nadia wearing a wheel helped her feel more liberated according to nadia wearing a wheel helped her communicate with people in this globalized world without putting herself on show it's what you say that's important not what you look like so this nadia is like I said, a second generation British Asian woman. She was, uh, she was, she was researched on by Professor Helen Watson. And the idea Helen Watson is trying to put over here is that wheeling does not necessarily has to be uh, is being seen in a negative manner. To be able to, uh, to be able to uh, explain her idea, she. Uh, interviewed females amongst these the three females she interviewed one of them was this young lady Nadia who started wearing a wheel at the age of 16 she started wearing a wheel because she felt she was proud of who she was she was proud of being a Muslim and she wanted the world to know that she was a Muslim she also felt like wearing a wheel made her feel more at uh, more may wearing a wheel gave her more of freedom. She got the power to communicate. She got the power to express herself without putting herself on show. Now she found that far from making her invisible, as many Western feminists claim, like wearing a wheel made her stand out. Yet it also helped her to avoid unwanted comments and attention from women. So. This, uh, this, 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 this example of a young lady, a British Asian a young lady, Nadia, explains us how wheel is not necessarily to be seen in a negative manner. Taking this ahead, Watson concluded that wheeling is often a reaction against an increasingly pervasive Western culture, a reaction or a response against an increasingly pervasive, increasingly pervasive Western culture. We are talking about cultural imperialism. We're talking about Western imperialism. We're talking about the idea as to how the Western culture, the Western ideas have started taking over the world. It can be seen as the assertion of independence. Wheeling can be seen as an assertion of independence. You're showing the world how you do not necessarily have to do what others are doing. By doing this, you can show the world that you have a separate identity and you can show the world how you reject the Western cultural imperialism. So according to Watson, Professor Watson from the University of Cambridge, 
wheeling is often a reaction. It's often a reaction against increasingly pervasive Western culture. It can be seen as an assertion of independence. It is something that helps you feel more independent, gives you a separate identity, and you get to be able to reject the Western imperial uh, western imperialism or cultural imperialism rather than seeing the wheel as a sign of male oppression it is a part of the search for an indigenous form of protest against patriarchy in society so look at how uh, uh, tables uh, how 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 tables have turned here look at how according to watson wheeling is part of the search for an indigenous form of protest a way through which you protesting against patriarchy within the society. Now, Watson's conclusion, however, should be treated with some caution, methodological uh, criticism that I had mentioned earlier. Her observations are based on a sample of three women. She appears to have made no attempt to find Muslim women who felt men or patriarchal society forced them into wearing the wheel against the will. So no theory is without criticism, but uh, nonetheless, the work done by Watson has been uh, highly appreciated and uh, she's uh, tried to fight against the uh, negative, negative, negative uh, view that is held by many people in the West about wheeling and how uh, wheeling is seen as an uh, oppressive uh, mean through which women are being uh, women are being, 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 being held back from uh, doing what the society expects them to do. Now, in the next section, explores the extent to which new forms of religion follow sim similar patterns of reflecting patriarchal ideology or alternatively, if they provide alternative ideas and practices. So if you remember, right at the beginning, we had spoken about how religion uh, is patriarchal or is it patriarchal or is it not patriarchal? And I had said we discussed this, putting our uh, putting this topic into two different, uh, dividing our topic into two different categories. Initially, we spoke about the more traditional forms of religion, uh, the more uh, popular forms of religion, which are known uh, by many as conservative forms of religion. And now we move on towards the newer forms of religion. Do more recent forms of religiosity reflect patriarchal ideology? Let me repeat. Do more recent forms of religiosity reflect patriarchal ideology? Given the huge array of new forms of religions emerging in recent years. Now, when we speak about these new forms of religion, we're typically referring to the NRMs and the NAMs. NRMs are new religious movements. NAMs are new age movements. Given the huge array of new forms of religions, religions emerging in recent years, it can be it can be difficult to make generalizations about the extent to which they perpetuate ideas which oppress women. However, through this section, we'd explore some examples which both challenge as well as support the claim that religions continue to uphold patriarchal ideology. Now, we'd talk about how these new religious movements first, and then we'd move on and discuss how new age movements affect uh, or have affected the experiences females have within religion. Now, as we speak about new religious movements over here, new religious movements, relatively modern forms of religion, which are different from or challenge the traditional religions in some way. Now, to put NRMs, the new religious movements, in the most simplistic of form, what are new religious movements? These are movements that started gaining popularity during the 1960s 1970s according to what and according to this new religious movements are relatively modern forms of religion they're relatively modern forms of religion which are different from traditional religions relatively modern forms of religion which are different from traditional religions that challenge traditional religions in some way or the other so when we speak about these nrms NRMs are not easy when it comes to making a comparison. When it, uh, Why is it that we say that they're not easy when it uh, comes to making comparisons? Because these NRMs, they have, they vary. They are different types of NRMs and it wouldn't be uh, right to uh, lump them all into one single category. 
if you remember, Roy Wallace in 1984 came up with three different categories of NRMs, the world rejecting NRMs, the world accommodating NRMs, and the world affirming NRMs. So to begin with, we will not get into details uh, related to the different types of NRMs. However, to begin with, when we speak about these NRMs, these NRMs, they vary considerably in relation to gender. The experiences within these NRMs that varies considerably, uh, uh, considerably in relation to how the experiences of males and females are within them. So to begin with, we'd speak about Susan Palmer, who is Susan Palmer? Susan Palmer from the University of Concordia. There you go. Susan Palmer from the University of Concordia. She is an affiliate professor. This website could help you get to her just in case you're interested. Now, NRMs, according to Susan Palmer, Palmer suggests that the majority of NRMs tend to reinforce conservative, simplistic ideas about the role of women as carers or mothers that uphold patriarchy. Now, according to Susan Palmer, Dr. Susan Palmer, according to Palmer, majority of these NRMs, just like the traditional religions, majority of these NRMs, just like traditional religions, they emphasize more on females' roles as carers, females' roles as mothers. And if you emphasize on females playing the role of carers or females having to play, uh, playing the role of mothers, this, according to Palmer, upholds patriarchal values. This, uh, this further reinforces patriarchal values, right? Patriarchy, male domination, male dominating values. A minority of new generation, uh, new religious movements offer opportunities for greater experimentation with gender roles. So if I put it in a simpler manner, according to Susan Palmer, majority of NRMs, majority of NRMs, they uphold patriarchal values. However, there is a tiny minority that we discussed through examples over here, they do encourage experimentation when it comes to females uh, and the females uh, when it comes to females or the roles that females have to play, right? For example, we'd speak about Raelians over here. You might as well need to Google Raelians. I could explain it to you, but that would take a lot of time. That would deviate from the topic. So Raelians for now, we're talking about a form of uh, NRM, a new religious movement that encourages experimentation when it comes to gender roles. They encourage transvesticism. Now, what is transvestitism? Transvestitism is the idea where, uh, where, 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 where uh, you're uh, encouraged to wear clothes uh, that are typically seen to be appropriate for an opposite sex. Or in other words, males being encouraged to wear clothes that are typically uh, seen to be for females and females on the other hand encouraged to wear clothes that are typically seen to be for males. Now, encouraging transvestitism as well as practicing the removal of gendered identity and behavior. Other new, other new religious movements sought to challenge patriarchal assumptions, although these practices are not always long-term. Now, according to Professor Susan Palmer, majority of NRMs, just like traditional religions, according to Professor Susan Palmer, majority of NRMs, just like traditional religions, they reinforce patriarchal values or they uphold patriarchy. Nonetheless, there are some, uh, there are a tiny minority of new religious movements that encourage experimentation when it comes to gender roles being played and to exemplify this she uh she 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 mentions she refers to raelians and how raelians encourage transvestitism how raelians encourage the removal of gendered identity and behavior and on the other hand susan palmer also refers to or gives an example of uh an nrm that initially tried to be gender neutral that initially tried to encourage females role beyond caring and loving and uh, domestic affairs but nonetheless this was not a long-term 
uh, long-term practice. Now, while doing this, she refers to the example of Raj, the Rajneesh movement, the Rajneesh movement from the 1980s, uh, 1981 to 1985. About this Rajneesh uh, movement, the gentleman who uh, initiated this was uh, is also referred to as Bhagwan Shri Rajneesh, uh, aka Osho. And Osho has uh, had a very controversial personality about Osho. There's uh, uh, this uh, show on Netflix, Wild Wild Country, which I believe has six episodes of 30 minutes each. You want to know about more about Rajneesh? It's an interesting show. You might as well watch that. So Osho or the Rajneesh movement, according to Susan Palmer, it initially did encourage gender neutrality. However, according to her, this did not last for very long. So the Rajneesh movement granted women leadership positions only shortly afterwards to be replaced by male leaders. Therefore, the overwhelming view is that new religious movements are unlikely to challenge patriarchy or indeed offer women any form of liberation. So the conclusive view over here by Susan Palmer, Dr. Susan Palmer is that it is unlikely that these NRMs would challenge patriarchy. It is unlikely that these NRMs would challenge patriarchy or indeed they would offer any sort of liberation to females. Now, taking this ahead while discussing this under the heading of NRMs, we talk about Pentecostalism. Now, again, uh, if you're aware of Pentecostalism, very good. If not, YouTube is there, Google is there. Over here, to begin with, I'd refer to NR, uh, Pentecostalism as a form of a protestant, uh, protestant, newer form of Protestant uh, Christianity. Now, some feminists express concerns about Pentecostalism's deep conservation with respect to women's roles. Now, remember, this is sociology. We talk about uh, arguments from both ends. We talk about, we, we, we discuss evidence or we discuss references in support of an idea and we move on and discuss evidence or theories against a particular idea too. So we're talking about how some feminists, they express a concern. They express a concern about Pentecostalism's deep conservation, Pentecostalism's deep conservation or deeply conservative ideas with respect to the role females play. However, Elizabeth Briscoe in 1996 carried out research into Pentecostalism in Colombia in the 1980s. Now, we'd have a look at what her findings were like, but remember, if she carried out her research in Colombia, the findings of this research might only be applicable to Colombia and not elsewhere, not worldwide. Or in other words, the findings might not be generalizable. So research into Pentecostalism in Colombia in the 1980s and found that Pentecostalism can be a source of change or an emancipation for women. Now, Pentecostalism being seen as a source of change or Pentecostalism being seen as uh, helping women with emancipation. However, let me add it on here. The popular topic, another popular topic that you get questions on is religion and social change. Remember, you could use pen, the example of Pentecostalism while writing an answer if you get a question on, uh, on, on, on religion and social change. So this could be an example that could be used over here of uh, Pentecostalism of the study that was conducted by Presco in 1996, where she researched on into Pentecostalism in Colombia. Now, Briscoe claims that Pentecostalism has the capacity to reform gender roles. According to her, Pentecostalism has the capacity to reform gender roles in ways that enhance female status. So according to Briscoe, Pentecostalism has the capacity to reform gender roles. She, it has a capacity to enhance female status. Brusco claims that Pentecostalism promotes female interests in practical ways, such as involving them into uh, the organization roles of Pentecostalism or valuing the contribution towards family. According to Elizabeth Brusco, Pentecostalism promotes female interests. It promotes female interests in simple yet practical ways. What sort of practical ways are we talking about over here? The involvement that females have 
been encouraged to have in organizational roles or the way they're valued for the contribution within the family. Pentecostalism also has the potential to challenge machismo or male dominance that is central to Latin American culture. This is possible through the expectations and teachings about the need for men to be respectful towards their wives and other female relatives. Now, according to Elizabeth Brusco, Pentecostalism has the uh, potential, the power, the capacity to be able to bring in a change. It advocates or it strongly emphasizes on how men are or how men should be respectable towards their wives, sorry, respectful towards their wives, how they should be respectful towards other female relatives. However, this finding is only limited to Colombia, so the pattern may not be reflected elsewhere. Now, remember, my dear, we were discussing about how different religions uh, are seen by many feminists. We spoke about how different, how different religions are seen uh, by many feminists. We discussed uh, how different feminists see the role religion plays when it comes to, uh, when it comes to uh, liberty or female liberty, right? Now we spoke about your traditional popular religions at the beginning, and then we went on, we spoke about NRMs, that is new religious movements. And towards the end, we'd quickly discuss new age movements. New age movements are the ideas of new age movements. They gained popularity during the 1980s, during 90s. It's a new way of being religious. It emphasizes on holistic milieu. It emphasizes on self-spirituality. It emphasizes on how individuals could find salvation within themselves. However, there's a lot more to uh, New Age movements that uh, you'd uh, understand if you read through it on your own. To begin with, the role NAMs play now. We spoke about the no role NRMs play. NRM is new religious movement. NAM is new age movement, right? Now we'd speak about new age movements. And it is generally uh, believed that NAMs are followed more by women. There is more of, there are, there'd be more of females you'd come across who'd be following NR, NAMs as compared to males. New age movements, they appear to attract women from uh, 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 women more from more than men, right? So new age movements, they appear to attract women more than men. For example, if you speak about the Candle Project, there's again an amazing, uh, I believe, seven minute YouTube video on uh, this Candle Project, a small town in the UK, where there was this uh, extensive research conducted for two and a half years. I mean, you might as well uh, YouTube uh, Professor Linda Woodhead, Linda Woodhead, um, bracket candle project. You would know, you'd understand better about this candle project there. Now, for example, the candle project in the UK notes that women are more likely to be part of a growing number of people who are not affiliated to traditional religions or religious organizations, but to instead attend new age movements that practice techniques such as yoga. So, according to this, according to the findings of the candle project. Professor Linda Woodhead and uh, I'm forgetting another name. Uh, Paul Helis, Paul Helis, right? You could, they're associated, they're affiliated more with the scandal project. And uh, one of the findings of the scandal project was that women or females, they're more likely to be a part of a growing number of people. They're more likely to be the ones who join NAMs and who want to let go of their affiliation with traditional forms of religion, right? A small town in the UK. Again, remember, being a sociology student, you should pick on these uh, hints. If a study is being conducted on a small town in UK, how likely is it that you'd be able to generalize the findings of this particular research elsewhere? So Michael York in 2004, claims that much of the outlook of New Age movements, their spirituality and organization lend itself to a more female-centered belief system. Michael York believes that the outlook of NAMs, remember the outlook, the outlook of NAMs, right? Their spirituality, or for the matter of fact, the organization in itself, 
it lends itself to a more female-centered belief system. Or in other words, according to Michael York in 2004, the outlook of NAMs, the spirituality or the emphasis on spirituality that these NAMs advocate, or for the matter of fact, the organizational uh, practices of NAMs, they make it more appealing for females to be a part of them, right? Who is uh, Michael York? Michael York is an American religious uh, scholar who is based in the UK. You could Google more about him just in case you're interested. Next, we speak about Cynthia Eller. Cynthia Eller, if we speak about her, she's an author or a professor of religion at Claremont Graduate University and the author of five scholarly books and two textbooks. She loves to cross-stitch in her free time as well. Now, if we speak about Cynthia Eller, she claims that New Age movements in the USA offer women the opportunity to be a part of a feminist spirituality movement as opposed to traditional patriarchal forms of religion. So according to Ella, the New Age movement, this New Age movement, it offers women the opportunity. It offers women the opportunity to be a part of a feminist spirituality movement remember when i was uh starting off with nms i had spoken about self spirituality you might as well find more on this right so according to ella she claims that new age movements in the usa offer women the opportunity to be a part of a feminist spirituality movement which females do not really uh get through traditional forms of religion so we spoke about nams over here Initially, we spoke about uh, the Candle Project. I had referred to Professor Linda Woodhead and Paul Helis while mentioning this. Number two, we spoke about Michael York. And number three, we spoke about Cynthia Eller, right? Remember, NAMs and NRMs, they are both seen to be the more recent forms of religiosity. Now, these recent forms of religiosity, they are popular more in the Western world as compared to other parts of the world. Now, the topic that we were discussing today was patriarchy and gender inequality in religion. To be able to understand better or uh, uh, understand this topic better, it is important that you uh, watch the video we have on feminist perspectives on religion. It, I believe, is an hour long video. Watching both of these videos would help you understand this entire topic better. Before I could zip this up, let me show you a few questions that we've had in our CIs on this. So we had this question in October, November 2021. The question says, women are oppressed by religion. Evaluate this view. So remember, this question says women are oppressed by religion. They are not specifying uh, if they're not specifying it to be uh, the popular, the popular religions or the new forms of religion. You could read through the indicative points in support of this and indicative points against this. You might as well pause this video, read through these uh, indicative points in support and against the idea. This would help you form your answer better. Now, taking this uh, ahead, we have another question over here. So yeah, taking this ahead, we have uh, another question over here. The question says, all religions are patriarchal and contribute to gender inequality. All religions are patriarchal and they contribute to gender uh, inequality. Again, you could pause the video here and read through this. You might as well want to read the indicative content in support of uh, this particular statement and against this statement. So yeah. Uh, and this particular question, this is from May, June 2021. And all of what we discussed today comes under the heading gender, feminism and religion, gender, feminism and religion. So, yeah, this is uh, pretty much it uh, for the day. Uh, take good care of yourselves. Stay happy, healthy, safe and protected. Stay humble, spread positivity, spread smiles and Allah Hafiz.